Well, good morning. I'm Chris, one of the pastors here, and uh, it is great to be with you. Our mission here at Calvary Bible Church is to glorify God, love people, and, and make disciples. And the vision that we've cast for us to, to live as as a community is that we would be a committed, worshiping community that knows the Word of God, that shows the Word of God in our application, and, uh, or sorry, knows the Word of God, grows in the Word of God through application, and shows the Word of God through service and evangelism. And we're going to continue this morning our series, Let's Be Church which uh, is a focus on what does it mean for us to gather together and and be God's called out people. And this morning, we're gonna take a look at how we can be God's growing people. That God has called us out, has given us an identity, but how do we grow in that given identity? How do we be healthy and, and continue to mature? Uh, If you have your Bibles, I'd encourage you to turn to uh, Psalms chapter 1, very well-known psalm, uh, but I think it's very poignant for uh, what we're talking about this morning. Psalms chapter 1, verses 1 through 3 writes this. It says, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. And here's the contrast. Blessed is the man, right? Uh, But his delight is in the law of the Lord, or the word of God. And on his law, he meditates day and night. Because of this, in verse 3, he is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither, and all that he does, he prospers. Are there any gardening people out here? Any any of my gardening fellowship community here? Anybody? Gardeners, raise your hands. Come on. Like, we got to come together. We're a unique bunch. So I've just begun to dabble in this as we've become homeowners. And I kind of have given myself this challenge to every year try to plant something new. And my family uh, is, is tired of me obsessing over different things. But I researched for months and months what I wanted to plant. And so we, we live in a, a neighborhood that's, um, we call it a cookie cutter neighborhood and our neighbors are like literally right next to us. And so you don't have a ton of privacy. So I looked up what would be good privacy trees because, you know, one, fences are expensive and you can see my fence has seen better days. And two, they don't make them so high. So I decided to go with the emerald green abervitae. And I love the emerald green abervitae. And I would look and, and try to find oh, where's a good price to get these trees and prepare to get them. And so I, I borrowed a friend's truck and I went and picked them up from Home Depot and these things were, were huge and I got them at a nice discount at the end of the season. And so I, I planted them in, followed some of the instructions and sure enough, you can see that two of them did not make it. Now, it's interesting because in studying, why didn't my abervites grow? I thought I, thought I, I did everything that I was supposed to. Uh, you know, uh, they're a little close together, some people have told me, but I want them to, to feel nice and lush. And so that way, all those windows in those other houses will be eventually covered when these things grow tall enough and they won't see me lounging around in my backyard. So those two trees there, they died. And, and I, I thought I did everything in my power to help them grow. But Nonetheless, they just, they didn't make it. And so I had to pull them out and, and plant new ones. And I've already got two different ones that have, are starting to struggle. So I've gone into all of this research to find out what makes these abervites tick. And so they need lots of water, uh, especially those first couple of years where the roots need to kind of grow and get settled. Uh, the abervite is a very shallow root system, so it's not deep. You don't want to over-fertilize it because then it will trick the roots not into going too far. And so you want slow-release fertilizer. They need lots of water per day. And so underneath all that mulch, I ran these soaker hoses that soak every, every day because I'm finding, oh, you want to conserve water and make sure that you're using the right amount. So you can tell that I've kind of like gone off the deep end into like my love for abervites here. And so we're driving along wherever we go and my kids are sick of it because I'll be like, oh, those are the green emerald abervites and see how tall they are. That's how tall ours are gonna get in the next five to 10 years. And let's make sure that we nurture them and prune them and help them get to to be this luscious size because I want them to be this healthy privacy screen for me. And so I've put a lot of effort 
into these trees. I want them to know that they're cared for by their owner and that they grow and that they be luscious. This year, I planted a couple uh, holly berry bushes because I'm hoping that they'll produce those nice, beautiful red berries that last through the winter. So you have that red or red berries that stick out and that white snow. And so again, trying to find out how do I care for these suckers. And for us as a people... I think it's important that we, we are not just a called out people and then boom, planted and left alone. God has given us instructions on how we're supposed to tend to ourselves, how we're supposed to make sure that we don't end up the dead tree, that we've gotten the right amount of water, that we've gotten the right nutrients, that we haven't gotten the wrong kind of calculation because you can, you can kill an abravite by over-fertilizing it or using the wrong type of fertilizer. And so you have to look up, okay, is this truly an evergreen tree that likes acidic fertilizer or does it like more, more nitrogen? Like you get into all these silly things, but they actually really make a difference. And so you go and you read from all these other gardeners who are kind of like sages of the gardening community and you say, what works for you? And so I have a friend who is a master gardener and I just pick his brain and I go over his house all the time and see this beautiful garden and I'm like, I want this. And he's like, okay. You're gonna have to work at it every year for about 40 years. And then this will, you'll get this beautiful garden. And I'm like, all right, so maybe by the time I'm bald, I'll have a beautiful garden. And so for us, I think it's important that we know that God hasn't just planted us, but that he's given everything that we need to be healthy. First, I'm sorry, 2 Peter 1, 3 says, we've been given everything that we need for life and for godliness. I want you to hear that. You, you have been given everything that you need. Sometimes we, we flounder in life and say, this is more than I can handle. I can't figure this out. I, I don't feel like I'm healthy. God has given you everything that you need. You just have to be willing to listen and to read. Listen, all the information for me to know how to make sure that these plants survive is available to me. And so I'm gonna do my best to make sure that they thrive. And so for us, as we look at our lives, are we like the tree that is planted by the streams of water? as verse three says, that yields its fruit in season and its leaves does not wither and all that he does, he prospers. So I'd ask you that question this morning. Is that you? Are you called out in Christ as an individual and are you growing? If you think of your life over the last five years, maybe 10 years, how have you changed as a disciple of Jesus? How have you grown? If my abravites aren't growing, I get worried. Now, first year, they have this kind of phrase. It takes three years for them to really kind of take root. So the first year, they sleep. The second year, they creep. And then the third year, they say that the trees leap and they start to really grow. Sometimes that's true for us as believers. But a lot of times, we kind of get stuck in that sleep stage where it's like, yep, I'm planted, but I'm not really changing. I'm not growing. I'm not healthy. I'm not vibrant. My roots aren't getting deeper. The neat thing about trees is they help each other. And trees will come and when one is struggling or one is getting blown, the roots will even go over another tree to kind of like hold it together. How cool is that, that God designed vegetation to function like that? And so I would ask you this question. How have you matured in the last five years? How have you grown? Some of you have been tending Calvary for a long, long time. You've heard amazing preaching for a long, long time but maybe our life doesn't look much different. And so this morning, I'm gonna encourage us that we need to grow, and we need to grow personally, and we need to grow corporately. So this morning's big idea is that disciples of Jesus grow in maturity as they are shaped by his presence and word. We are shaped and matured by God's presence and his word. And you've heard me a couple times in the last few weeks talk about how are we arranging our life to make space for that work to happen. We can't set it and forget it. We have to give attention so that we are growing people. And God gives some great examples and principles throughout all of Scripture. And we've kind of coined these as spiritual disciplines. The things, the steps that we would take in order that we may grow. And some of these are natural for us, and some of them are, are they feel a little more awkward or uncomfortable, or they're, they're not 
They don't really fit in my natural rhythms. And so we have to try a little bit and give ourselves some effort. So if we're going to be a church that grows personally, first we need to know that we need the word of God. If I'm going to grow, I need food. And I need the right food. If I lived on uh, Twinkies and Sour Patch Kids, I would die pretty quickly, okay? I need the right food. I need to eat healthy things in order that I may grow. And this is true of us. A lot of times we read uh, scripture and, and we kind of forget that part of the gospel is that God calls us, gives us an identity, and then says that we're supposed to grow. If you turn with me to the Great Commission in Matthew 28, and some have coined this the great omission of the Great Commission within evangelicalism is verse 20. So if we, let's read verse 19 together, and this will feel familiar to you, but it says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. All right, go, go preach the gospel, baptize them, and we're good. Let's have a rally. Let's get people to sign a card to say, I made a decision, and you go on their merry way. But that, is, that omits one of the most significant parts of this Great Commission, which is in verse 20, which is just a continuation. This is part of the Great Commission. Verse 20, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. Observe all that I have commanded you. So live like I've taught you to live. Jesus is telling his disciples, I've given you both an example to follow. I've given you verbal instruction. I've helped you understand God's written instruction. And so part of the responsibility of a called out people is that you're gonna observe God's word and that it has weight in your life, that it has authority in your life, and it has the power to change you. We got to hear some neat testimonies last week. Somebody said, I opened up the Bible, and that is what got me. God's word had the ability to transform. And he says this in his word. He, he gives examples of this. In Hebrews 4.12, it says, For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword piercing to the divisions of the soul and the spirit of joints and of marrow and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. That's the power of the word of God, that it can transform you, that it can cut off the parts of you that aren't healthy. Guess what? Sometimes you need pruning. There, there we, we, not too long ago, studied in the gospel of John how the vine dresser would prune the vines. The word of God does that for us. And so how do we respond to the, the word of God? One of my favorite examples is in Ezra. Ezra 7.10, it talks about how he set his heart to study the law of the Lord and to do it and to teach his statutes and rules in Israel. He decided to com commit his life to, I'm going to study this, I'm going to know it, and I'm going to live by it. So let's be a church that grows in how we know God's word how we delight in that word. And so it's our goal to be transformed into the image of Christ by experiencing God through his word. You've heard me talk about that. I, my, one of my goals is that you would experience God, right? Information is the consolation prize to encounter. And so we, as people, one of the primary ways that we encounter God is his word. Because this is the thing that is most clear. This is the thing that we can't, misunderstand through feelings or how we say, oh, I've had this experience. No, no, we filter everything through God's word. All of my experiences in my life, I try to interpret through the lens that is scripture. I try to help my life make sense through the lens that is scripture so that I can be transformed into the image of Christ. Let's be a people that commit ourselves to the word. And the word tells us to do the next thing, the spiritual discipline of prayer. Colossians 4.2 writes, continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in, in it with thanksgiving. Pray, be continually watchful. And I love how he uses this word. You're gonna see prayer and thanksgiving attached a lot when you read God's word. 
You're going to see people praying frequently and thanksgiving is always combined in there. And there's a reason they kind of go together. Prayer becomes not only this place to request, but also the place where we surrender and we look back and be thankful because we know God and God is a God who keeps his promises. And then in 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, it writes, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances. Pray without ceasing. Does that mean that we're gonna be a people that I'm gonna quit my job so that I can pray all day? I I don't know that that's how we should interpret this passage. This should be very similar to as you go that we talked about uh, a couple years ago when we studied the Great Commission was as you go, preach the gospel, right? So as you live your life, have a posture and mindset of prayer. I, I liken it to this. We're in a society now where communication is much easier. And so we can communicate briefly and quickly. Uh, you know, some of us grew up in a day and age where you, you didn't have a phone. You didn't know what was going on. I remember many a soccer practices sitting at the field waiting for my dad to pick me up from work. And I had no clue where he was because we didn't have cell phones. And he was running late. And I would sit there for hours. And I would wait. And guess what? I didn't worry because that was pretty normal back then, right? Some of you, if your kid or your parent doesn't text you within five minutes of when they're supposed to be there, phone call, phone call, voicemail, text messages, and then you open up your phone, like, right? So now we have this great thing of communication. But do we communicate God like we communicate with each other? My job allows me to have some flexibility within uh, communicating with my wife throughout the day. And so I can, in between a meeting or in between some study, I can just shoot a message. Hey, I'm I'm thinking about you or pray about this or, you know, we're just kind of having this kind of constant stream of communication. And so we kind of have this unique access to one another that allows us to kind of be on the same page most of the time we have the opportunity to be on the same page with God all the time. You don't even have to verbally say it because God understands your heart and your mind. You can live in a posture of prayer that doesn't stop. That whatever you're experiencing, whatever you're going through, you're you're communicating to the Lord, you're giving to the Lord, you're asking for the Lord to give you wisdom and discernment. This is a spiritual discipline. Jesus models prayer for us in powerful ways. He he goes constantly, leaves his disciples, and he goes and he spends time praying. One of the things that he does right before he begins his significant public ministry is he goes into the wilderness for 40 days, 40 nights, and he prays and he fasts. And so Jesus models prayer for us. And so the thing that comes with prayer sometimes is fasting. And so what is fasting? Fasting is denying our flesh what it wants so that we can focus more clearly on strengthening our spirit. And so we have the practice where we withhold from physical nourishment, something our body needs, so that we can train our muscle of the spirit. And one of the things that is really important about doing that is because when trouble comes and you're going to experience difficulty in your life that your flesh is going to want to be weak on, if you've already trained the muscle of the spirit, you rely on that muscle. You're able to rely on the spirit to say, I can go to the Lord in prayer and I can lean on him, lean on his understanding and not on my strength. Because my flesh is weak. My flesh will fail. We're going to take a deeper dive into that in just a few weeks when we start our series in Galatians. But fasting is something that Jesus did. And he fasted and he committed himself to showing his disciples and showing us, the readers of Matthew 4, that he indeed leaned on the Spirit of God. In Acts 14, 23 It talks about the disciples committing themselves with prayer and fasting. They committed them to the Lord in whom they had believed. And so, again, they were committing their lives to a surrender of relying on the Spirit to guide and provide. Are you leaning on the Spirit to guide you and provide for you? And so I would encourage you, how are you praying How are you fasting? 
take opportunity. And I don't take fasting lightly. We can get into more conversations about that specifically. But do, do some examining for your own heart and say, is this something that God would ask me to participate in? But I can tell you right now, prayer, prayer is a non-negotiable. Pray like Jesus often. Pray like Jesus. Pray often. And we see the model that he provides for us in the way that he goes and he spends time in prayer and he spends time connecting with the Father. He does that through silence and solitude. Not only does he do that in Matthew 4, but he continually withdraws himself after significant communication or ministry or interacting with crowds. He goes away, pulls back for some silence and solitude so that he can reflect and retune with the Father. And so that's important for us as people that we look for opportunities for our lives to kind of remove the noise. You see, I've said before, the greatest commodity within our culture is attention and time. And so there are so many things that are fighting for your time, and there's so many things that are fighting for your attention that you're going to need to be intentional about taking some time where you remove the noise and you say, I'm going to use this time as a gift, as an opportunity to delight myself in the presence of God and the word of God. And that's gonna begin to bear some powerful fruit. One of the things that I like to encourage people to do when they do silence and solitude is journal. Journaling can be an excellent tool for us as believers to reflect and remember. The Psalms are songs of worship, but they're also scribed down. What what a great kind of... Uh, memory to be able to look back and see, hey, this is how God was working. This is how I was feeling in the moment, how I was processing and, and crying out to God. Some of us who use social media, you'll remember the, that little feature, the time hop feature that will like go back and be like eight years ago on this day. And you're like, oh, wow, yeah, life isn't that bad. This is good. And it kind of like helps remind us of good things. Journaling can be that, that, that same discipline. It can be almost like a spiritual marker that reminds us of different marks of how God has worked. I asked uh, the young men's cohort that I'm leading with Adam Bean and Dave Spinelli to invest in journaling this year. And so I bought each of them a journal and we're working through a stack of books and we're, we're having a devotional that we're reading through. And the reason that I asked them to do that because I knew it would be a significant tool to help them take their own spiritual formation and growth seriously. So I asked a few of them uh, if they would just respond to me and, and said, what are the things that you've experienced out of journaling? How has this benefited you? And I just want to read you a couple of their responses just from our own body here. One of them wrote that uh, journaling has helped me to be honest with myself. It's forced me to open up and see my emotions and helped me understand that my mind tricks me into thinking that I'm good most of the time when in fact I struggle with a lot. And seeing my struggles has allowed me to pray more honestly to God about what I'm dealing with. Journaling has helped me organize my ideas. Journaling has forced me to spend more time with God, which is priceless. Another one wrote this. The biggest takeaway I've got from journaling, yes, I agree with it now. He was a little resistant, just in a different format. I, he likes to write notes instead of journal. It requires me to comprehend what I was reading. I can't just write something down to write something down. So often I found myself rereading to really grasp what my first thoughts were. Then jotting down my first thoughts, capturing them quickly helped me be more honest with myself and how I interpreted scripture. Some days were two words and some days were paragraphs. It forced me to comprehend and it forced me to be honest. And then finally, the, another one writes, three great things I've noticed about journaling through uh, our books and study. First, one, I stay engaged much better while reading when I am writing things down, underlining them, etc. Second, being able to go back and look at what perspective you had on things and discuss them with others has been hugely helpful as well. And number three, having to articulate how I understand ideas when putting them on paper forces me to consider them more deeply and understand them more thoroughly than otherwise. And so I'd encourage you, how are you taking seriously your growth? 
How are you taking seriously your personal disciplines that you're thinking through and spending time with? You see, journaling helps to process our own thoughts and emotions and recount the work and character of God throughout our lives. And last week, we talked about the two ordinances that we participate in, and we want to remember and proclaim. And journaling does this on a micro level. Journaling does this for us so that we can look back and see who our God has been in our life. And then it can also help us to understand who we are in the light of who God is. And so this leads to another spiritual discipline, which is stewardship. Ephesians 5, 15 through 16 writes, Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of time because the days are evil. This is a great reminder. There is things out in our world that will rob you of missing out on the benefit of growing with God. And sometimes they're not intrinsically bad things. Sometimes they're good things. But there's a phrase I like to use a lot, and that is when a good thing becomes a ruling thing, it's no longer a good thing. And so there are good things in your life that are now ruling you. Maybe it's kids' sports in that schedule. Maybe it's entertainment. Or maybe it's gardening. (laughs) I've got to be able to let it go. I'll be honest. Yesterday, I had a whole chore list and chose not to do it at all. It was beautiful. It was great. I don't know if my wife appreciated it, but I, I did enjoy the day. And so how do we look to let the word of God be the thing that rules us so that we steward the gift of life that he's blessed us with? And we can enjoy things. I think we should enjoy life. God God didn't create us to be miserable and to be stuck under the impression of work and law. It came that we may have life and have it abundantly. And so how do we steward our life in such a way that allows space to interact with God and to grow and to interact in God and grow with others? And this will lead us to understand part of our mission. Our mission is to glorify God and to love people and to make disciples. That's kind of the purpose that God has created us for. And so how are we committing our lives to be part of evangelism? See, we talked about the great omission, but we can't forget the great commission. This is what God has called us as disciples to do, to go and preach the gospel as you go. And how we interact with outsiders is important. And how we interact with people is going to stem from who we are in God. Colossians 4, 5 through 6 says this, walk in wisdom towards outsiders, making the best use of the time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. Your character will impact how you interact with others and how you interact with others who are not only lost, but also how you interact with others who are enslaved to evil and they are participating in that. And it's easy for us sometimes to think about ourselves better than them, but when we remember who we are in Christ, when we've rooted ourselves in the word of God, I'm able to have compassion on them because I know the only thing I have to boast in is that I know Jesus. And so then I have a, a spirit that says, I want to walk in wisdom and graciousness towards outsiders and call them to repentance in Jesus. And then the final discipline that I would encourage you to consider in reflecting in in your life, in your day-to-day, in your personal time is serving. Psalm 102 says, serve the Lord with gladness. There are many of you in this room who I have witnessed delighting in what it means to serve God, delighting in what it means to serve others. In John 12, 26, we were just there about a year ago. Jesus says, if anyone serves me, he must follow me. And where I am, there will be my servant be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. How are you serving God? How are you centering your life, as we sang this morning, to glorify God and to love people? 
See, Philippians 2, 3 through 4 reminds us to do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. And as we grow and as we mature, we're going to become attuned to the interests of others and the needs of others to recognize, hey, they, they need time, attention, space, encouragement, care. And so as we grow personally as a church, individually, when we gather, hopefully, we'll be a, a church that grows corporately. And I don't care specifically about numbers, that, that God gets to make that decision and how he's going to grow Calvary Bible Church numerically. What, as your pastor, what I'm most uh, interested in is seeing that we grow as a mature people, that those of us who gather grow in Christ. And this has been a, 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 something that I've thought through a lot now as a parent, and I've, I've interacted with uh, people who have, have raised their children in church and then watch their children and just have a hard time alchemating or navigating that adult life. And one of the things that the Lord has been pressing upon my heart is that there's a distinction between growing the kids in church and growing the kids in Christ. And so we have a responsibility to grow in Christ as individuals and grow in Christ as a church. That we know what it means to have a deep and meaningful relationship with our creator. And that we delight in submitting to his ways. And that's going to help us as a people do three things. And we've talked about these already, but we're going to highlight again this morning. Let's be a church that grows corporately. And we're going to do this through gathering. We read in Acts chapter 2, verse 42, that these uh, believers were, were gathering together and they were devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching they were sharing life together. They were in one another's homes. They were worshiping and rejoicing. And so that meant that they had to have people in their life. And I'm, I'm sad because I hear stories frequently about people who have had really negative church experiences. And sometimes I've, I've been the cause of that for people and, and, and I've had to repent and, and work out how do I give people the opportunity to have closure or heal but I want you to know you can't be a believer and say it's just me and Jesus because that's not the family that Jesus welcomed you into. Jesus welcomed you into a family that is filled with a whole bunch of people who are different, who don't look like you, who may not think like you, who may not act like you, but we all have one thing in common. We want to love God and obey God and submit ourselves to his word. And so as we gather as a family, I want to ask this question of your Christian life. Who are you walking next to? Meaningfully. Not like, hey, I say hello to this person or I shake their hand every time on Sunday. But who are you meaningfully sharing your life with that's part of this body? That's an important part of what it means for us to be a church that grows together because you're not gonna grow by yourself. And then the second follow-up question is who in your life have you given the authority, permission, and have you encouraged to call you out? I could word it this way. Who are you submitting yourself to? Who are you interacting with where you're saying, I'm going to put myself underneath your care. And that care can be encouragement. That care can be admonishment. That care can be correction. Scripture is filled with examples of how we're to call brothers and sisters back into fellowship so that way we can experience the joy of being part of God's family. And so I'd ask you this. Hebrews 10, 24 through 25 says this. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. How in your life are you living in a way that is encouraging one another? How are you considering to stir one another up to love and good works? 
And I would then ask, maybe you don't have anybody in your life that's doing that for you. And so seek that out. I remember as a young man, I, I knew I needed mentors. So I sought them out and I said, hey, what I see about your life is the kind of life that I wanna live. Can I meet with you? Can I ask you questions? I'm, I'm a pastor here and I still do that. There are men who I regularly submit myself to because I'm flawed and I'm weak and I need to grow. And you do too. And so as we do this, as we're a growing people that gather, that encourage one another, that delight in God's word, we're gonna be a people that worship. We're gonna be a people that, as Ephesians 5 says, we address one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody, melody to the Lord with your heart. And we gather here together and we sing songs that delight in the person and the work of God. We remind one another of truth. And it's really encouraging to be in a room full of people that are singing the same things that I believe, that are delighting in the same truths that I'm refreshing my soul with. And I think it gives us a picture of heaven. It gives us a picture of the new heaven and the new earth. In Revelation, we see constantly these phrases of worship where the saints are gonna go before God and they're gonna sing like in Revelation 4, 11, Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created that we get to know and have a relationship with the creator, that we exist because he willed it. That is pretty spectacular if you ask me. And so as we are a worshiping people who gather, let's also be a loving people who gather. We read just recently in our series in the Gospel of John, in John 13, 35, by this all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Are you committed to the spiritual disciplines in your own life? Have you arranged your life in such a way that you can delight in them? And as you delight in them, let's do them together. Let's be a people that practice these things that God has given to us together. You see, disciples of Jesus have the blessing of walking next to one another as they enjoy the power of his word the comfort of his presence and the hope of his promise. Let's pray together. Father, thank you that you help us grow. Thank you that you've given us instructions so that we know how to be healthy and we know uh, how to be a, a plant that is rooted by streams of living water, that its leaves and fruit do not wither in seasons of drought. God, help Calvary Bible Church to be a place that glorifies you, that loves one another, and help us to make disciples. We pray this in your name. Amen.